Kia ora koutou everyone. I'm Brian Crump. I have a BA and I'm proud of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah damn straight. 1987, Victoria University. Geography. So, oh look, come on guys. Let's not divide and conquer before we even start. Geography, economics, political science, bit of music thrown in there as well. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. There's a few musicians in the crowd, I'm sure of it. I spotted one before. It's great to have you along for Arts 21. Thanks for all of you who've made it on this rather wet and shaky night. I understand that Courtney Place has just been cordoned off. Obviously, earthquake checks and some of the buildings there have picked up a few more fractures that we're now taking a vase of action over. Maybe that's one of the reasons that some people can't make it is because one of the main arterial routes to this part of town has gone. It's been a big week, I think, for events which might highlight the need for the humanities, the need for an understanding of social sciences in our world. I'm thinking of last week of the election of Donald Trump I guess before that, the Brexit vote, where it seems that slogans have won out. Slogans that aren't really backed up maybe by that much, but the slogans have worked with enough people to make significant change in the United Kingdom and now the United States. I was thinking, and maybe I'm a little bit of a pessimist here, but I was thinking when the Trump vote came through last week of the words of W.B. W. Yeats in that great poem, The Second Coming. The center cannot hold, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The best lack all conviction, and the worst are filled with passionate intensity. As I think about how it is when sometimes to really think through problems, it's not simple. The answers aren't simple. Slogans are appealing because they offer a quick fix, but the fix is not necessarily quick. And of course, with the big shake in Melbourne and of course here in Wellington, we've been reminded again that even in the sciences, the hard and fast sciences, which maybe deal with facts, there's so much we don't know. So much. So much that we still have to learn. And so much which maybe will come from insights that don't come from the field of specialty for those engaged in finding answers for the questions that address us at the moment. What we're going to do over the next hour and a half or so is discuss the role of the humanities, the arts. But when we talk about the arts, we're talking not about the performing arts, but the humanities and the social sciences in our future and whether there's a need for them. Because most of you here tonight will be aware, I'm sure, of cutbacks to the funding of humanities in various tertiary institutions. Otago University comes to mind. And we're going to talk about whether there's a role, there's a future, also in the market-driven world that we now have in our university system. It might not be entirely market-driven, but the market makes a difference. Steve Mahari is going to be our key speaker. But then we'll have, after Steve has spoken, actually once we've had Steve, we'll take a break from talking to have a performance from a slam poet, Callum Mara, who's down there at the front. He's probably warming up inside his head right now. Uh, and then a panel of people of various disciplines. John Milford representing the business world. He's from the Chamber of Commerce here in New Zealand in Wellington, Nicola Leggett, journalist, long-time journalist, representing the world of literature, Hannah August, and Paul Spoonley, from right smack bang in the heart of humanities, a demographer, who's just actually got down from a careers advisory seminar in Hamilton. I hope he put a plug in for the humanities there. They're going to come up and we're going to have a panel discussion. They're going to address a question that I threw at them earlier, which is, give me an example of something from outside of your field of specialty that has informed your work, informed your career. We'll kick off with that, but there's lots more to chew as well. But right now, and then 
as well, we've got, we'll wrap up at around about a quarter to eight, and there are refreshments in the Rangi Marai room, which is across on the other side. If you go over that little bridge, the bridge is still there. Hopefully it will be. Uh, there'll be refreshments, drinks, and nibbles. And now, I'm going to welcome onto the stage briefly the organizer of today's event, Richard Shaw. Professor of Political Science at Massey University, Massey University campus in Palmerston North, aka the Mothership. <laughs> hey, ah, te me anui o te ao. Maku i ke atu, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. No re ra, he mihi mahana, ki a koto katoa. Mana whenua, tēnā koutou. E ngā mana, e ngā reo, tēnā koutou. Nau mai, hairi mai, ki tēnē hui. And now this makes me nervous, so I'm just going to walk away from that. Um, but not out of the spotlight. <laughs> My name is Richard Shaw. Amongst the, and a range of things, I'm one of the directors of the BA. I'm responsible for external connections. And on behalf of the College of the Humanities and the Social Sciences, um, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you here to this event tonight. And I would, would very much like to say thank you. A number of people couldn't make it here. Um, I entirely understand why that might be the case given the awful week that you have had and that folks further south have had. So thank you very, very much on behalf of Professor Paul Spoonley, who's the Pro Vice Chancellor in the college, for making it out here tonight. Um, I have three minutes now, two minutes and 35 seconds, to do two things really. The first is to say a series of thank yous. I've thanked you for coming. I'll just reiterate that. I'd like to thank the Wellington Chamber of Commerce as well. John Milford's here, but we're partnering with the Wellington Chamber of Commerce tonight. I'd like to thank each of the people who are presenting tonight. Hannah August, Nicola Leggett, Paul Spoonley, John Milford, Callum Mara, Brian Crump, the Vice Chancellor, who's around there. Uh, and I want very briefly to set a context for this particular event. Brian's already mentioned, um, he hasn't mentioned it a lot, but it's going to come up in, in conversations, I would imagine, what life in a post-truth, post-Trump universe might be like. Uh, there is another dimension to the sort of uh, context within which the evening exists here, and that concerns the coming world of work. A number of you will be familiar with Michael Frey and Carl Osborne's figure of 46% of jobs that are at risk at digitisation. Timir, 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 Timir. It's a contestable figure, but it starts to influence the conversations that we have about the future of work. And we could play a game in the one minute, 17 seconds that I have left, and I would say to you, what does the acronym BA mean? And you, because you're decent people and you laughed at the first joke that Brian made, would come out with sensible responses, but an awful lot of people wouldn't. They would come out with things that essentially decoded mean a BA doesn't sound like a job. You're not going to find work with a BA because it doesn't sound like a job. In fact, those of us who are part of the humanities and the social sciences at our university, at the universities that you are part of, including the local University of Victoria, we know that the world of work is changing and that the kind of stuff that we do, we don't have a monopoly on these things, but the kind of things that we do, critical thinking, reflexive thinking, helping people to construct good questions, enabling people to get on with people who don't look like them and don't think like them and don't speak like them, those things are critical not only to a civilised post-Trumpian world, but they're critical to the world of work as well. So that's the broad context within which the Arts 21 event is taking place this evening. Before I disappear, having made my three minutes, there's one last person who I would particularly like to thank. Uh, her name is Nicole Canning. She's a colleague of mine in external relations. This was her idea. Uh, she has done almost all of the work involved. She's not here at the moment, but Nicole, thanks very much. Enjoy your evening. Thank you for coming. Vice Chancellor Steve Mahari, I'd like to quote from an article. These days, um, to help RNZ cover costs, as well as hosting the night show on RNZ National, I also read the news. And there was a news item that I recall a few weeks back. Actually, it was a few months back now. Um, this is not the RNZ transcript. This is from the Otago Daily Times. Compulsory redundancies may be required in the University of Otago Division of Humanities. At present, 450 staff are employed in the division. A wide range of division subjects includes languages, history, law, music, teaching, theology, and law. 
That's a typographical error, I think. <laughs> this year, enrollments in the division fell 4.6%, 237 equivalent full-time students. Roles have been falling since 2011. The reason I mention that is because I have no doubt that our keynote speaker, Steve Mahari, Vice Chancellor of Massey University, who has a long history, a long background in the humanities and social science, though he's also done business as well as a lecturer. He's been a crush as Palmerston North City Councillor. He's been a cabinet minister. He's been the minister of TVNZ. He's worked with science and social development when he was in government. And I'm sure he's going to speak in favour of the humanities. Well, of course he would. But it's one thing to talk that talk. Can you walk it in the face of market changes, changes in demands, if students don't want to study the humanities? Can we keep on offering them? Please welcome to the rostrum, Steve Mahari. It feels, it feels a little dramatic to be out on the wings and to appear in front of you just like that. Uh, Brian, great to be here with you. Um, I get to listen to Brian's show, as many of you would do, of an evening when I'm driving back and forth between Palmas North and, uh, and Wellington. You are an oasis of intelligence in an otherwise post-Trumpian world, uh, Brian. Uh, we've all learnt wonderful sayings there, haven't we? Like, for example, when those Aucklanders come down here, they're not bringing their best. They're bringing criminals. They're bringing rapists, they're bringing murderers. We should build a wall. In fact, actually, Wellington's one of the easiest places to do it. You just have to put one across the Naranga Gorge and that's it. <laughs> no one will get in here anymore, so we should, we should give, that, give that a whirl. Um, we will have a theme uh, tonight about um, being in a post-Trumpian world and all the things that that might mean for the relevance of the arts. <clears throat> Let me acknowledge a couple of people down here at the front. Richard, I'm going to come back to you later on because of your starring role in things here and answer one of the questions that was raised by Brian Nicola Leggett, who runs our Mass University Press, which is going from strength to strength. Paul Spoonie, I'll come back to you too because how wonderful you are. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name, but John, John Milmo, you can introduce yourself later on. <laughs> it's, it's great to have um, all of you here and you'll be part of the panel later on and when people will get to know you and to kind of look around the room, there are some familiar faces and can I say I'm stunned that you're here. That this, this week hasn't been easy, actually, for, for Wellingtonians. And I've noticed I've been back and forwards and now the city going to Auckland and coming in here. The plane load of people the other day coming in here did not want to come. And it wasn't just the fact that the plane was going like that trying to get here. And the woman next to me had, had her arms around the seat with her head against the seat coming and going, oh, no, not, not another one. They didn't want to come back here because most of them were just a, a little bit afraid that the whole city was going uh, to get another, another major earthquake, and this time it would be a little bit like the second one in Christchurch, the woman next to me said, and the second time wasn't so much, uh, so much for people down there. So it's been a tough week, and I think we should uh, acknowledge that some people won't have made it here tonight because they just want to get on and do things around their families and so on. So thank you very much for taking time to come. The world we live in is a different world. As we always say now, it's a globalising world, although we'll talk a bit about deglobalising a little bit later on. It's a knowledge economy world. All of these kinds of trends have been around for, for the last little while, but in this world, the arts have found life pretty tough. It hasn't been a good one for them. And for the purposes of discussion, I want to use Brian's definition, very broad one. So we're talking about literature, we're talking about performing arts, we're talking about philosophy, comparative religion, cultural studies, and all of those disciplines that run alongside the arts, like anthropology, history, economics. I think economics is a, is a people discipline, by the way. The tragedy of the world is it decided it was a science and went off and forgot about people and just ran models. Cultural geography, sociology, which is the queen of disciplines. Everybody should study that if they could possibly do that during their life. Uh, psychology and linguistics. And before I go any further, I need to know the nature of the audience. Who's got a BA? Who's got an arts degree? Sad few, that's the rest of you. Ellen, Ellen over there, lawyer, you see. Need, a, need to get yourself in. So I'm a sympathetic audience. I can pretty much say what I like, I think, here, because it's a, it's a sympathetic audience. So there's the odd engineer here who will be looking very, very uh, sceptically at what, what I've got to say. So we know that those disciplines that make up arts are the disciplines that are finding it quite difficult in this kind of, of environment. And the environment's getting harder and harder because of the focus simply on the utility of education. 
So STEM subjects now are what we are supposed to do, and I've got no problem with that. To study science, technology, engineering, maths, this seems pretty sensible to me. We should be doing it. We don't do enough of it. There are too many lawyers and accountants in the country. We know that. We train too many. If we're going to be the kind of country we want to be in the 21st century, we don't want to stop training those kinds of people, but we want to train other kinds of people. That's, that's OK. But these whole, this whole shift has been about this notion of education being linked to getting a job. So in that kind of environment, what the arts have found is that their funding has been cut, the value of their research has been questioned, staff have been downsized, as we heard in places like Otago at the present time. The number of students has fallen quite dramatically in, in the arts and all of these kinds of subjects. And you get constant criticism from commentators in the media that you should do hard subjects and not soft subjects. So you say, oh, it's a soft question to understand how you fix poverty. No one seems to have done it yet, so it must be quite a hard question. But somehow that's taken to be a soft question, and these are soft disciplines that you do it in that. And that's kind of gotten into the, the discussion around the, the world, hasn't it, that these subjects perhaps don't, don't do the job. So the arts in this environment have started having to justify themselves and say, well, what's our utility? In the institution that I'm part of, Massey University, with Paul Spooney and Richard Shaw, uh, these folks have done an incredible job over the last little while of just getting out there and telling the story of why the arts matter, but also not talking defensively about the arts and not saying the status quo should be just left alone because it, is, it, it should be no problem for any discipline, whether it's engineering, law, or the arts, to defend itself in a positive way. That is, tell its story and say, this is why you think it's relevant. This is why it should be something that we should be studying. And so much of what we do in the arts area is to end up saying, leave us alone. We're a bit defensive about this. We think it's too important to go away, but we can't really explain why. This is not not sensible place to be. The world has changed. The arts are just the same as everything else. It has to explain itself. People have a right to know why they're paying for this kind of activity in their society and what does it do uh, for them. And we, we who work in this area should be prepared to talk about that with people in a sensible and open way. To paraphrase Socrates through Popper, not everybody can think up an idea, but everybody is entirely capable of talking about an idea. And so we should make what we know available to people in an open and accessible kind of way. And the arts, of course, may have to face the fact that some of the things that they do do deserve criticism. It may be that some of the things they do deserve not to be done anymore, that they should be renewed in some kind of way, which is exactly what Paul Spurney and Richard Shaw have been doing with the program at Massey. But if I'm tolerant of all of these kinds of things and feel that we should be talking about ourselves, I'm a whole lot less tolerant when you start to get the kind of uninformed criticism of the arts that you tend to see around the place. People just basing their ideas of what they think about the arts on some kind of unformed or ill-informed prejudice, and therefore away they go, and it makes you, like Goebbels, want to reach for your gun and say, no, I don't, I don't agree with you for that. But on top of that, over the last little while, we've done, begun to discover just how important it is because you get very, very intolerant of these kinds of discussions when you start to meet people like Boris Johnson, like Nigel Farage, and Donald Trump. These kinds of people have invented what we now call this post-truth era. It used to be a joke, didn't it, remember? People used to come on these shows on television, American television, they'd laugh about the Donald winning, and they'd laugh about the kinds of people that Farage uh, represented, and they would say, this will, will never change. Well, it has, and the kind of debate that they have brought us down to uh, suggests to me at times that you feel like they just need a damn good arts education. Wish they would go off and get themselves that kind of education. Because if they did, the argument I want to make tonight is that they'll get knowledge, attitudes, competencies, and skills, which will serve them well. It will serve them well. In fact, the argument I want to make is it will set them free. The people who have access to this kind of education are much less likely to spend their time listening con to conspiracy theories about how the world will work or allowing themselves to be drawn into slogans which sound okay, have no real base to them, but they don't have the skills to really inquire, so they begin to accept what is put in front of them. So I'm going to argue that the relevance 
of an arts degree is much broader than we might traditionally argue. And in the kind of environment we have now, it's absolutely essential that we have more and more people have access to this kind of education because if we can get more people, then we get a community of people who are set free, who are set free by the fact they share ways of looking at the world which allow them to work their way through the murk that's put in front of them and to be free in the sense that they understand how their world works and they can operate it in a way which allows them to move progressively forward. Well, you might say, all very well, but when I leave here, I want some key lines about how I get a job. These things can be held off for a moment. So I should say that before I move on to these stories. So these are some of the things you might want to take away as key lines when people say, does it get you a job? 652 US born, the survey is usually done in the US and so on, CEOs and heads of product engineering revealed that almost 60% of them had a liberal arts degree. Probably was hard to get out of them, but they agreed that that's what they, they had. Another study of 100 FTSE companies CEOs found that 34% of them had studied arts, social sciences or humanities, while 31% had studied science. Then you get the Steve Jobs quote which says, it is in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough, it's technology married with liberal arts, married with humanities that yields us the results that make our hearts sing. Biggest company in the history of the world as you know. Always through his career, Jobs privileged the notion that humanities was something that should be married to what his staff were doing. Closer to home, uh, Kim Campbell, leader of the business community, says that soft skills are really important. I actually don't like the term soft skills, but we'll let him away for it because of what he says. They're really important. Do you get along with other people? Are you comfortable with other cultures? Are you able to learn other skills? Are you willing to change as things change? Are you flexible in your attitudes to things? These are hard to measure, but boy, they are important in building a career, says Kim. The flexibility that Kim mentions, of course, may well turn out to be a bit of a game breaker in this century because, as Richard mentioned before, we now have this figure of 46% of jobs will disappear or radically change, and 65% of school-aged children may do jobs that do not exist yet, is the figure. So being a flexible, innovative, creative kind of person may help, and just as an aside, you all know that 46.3% of all stats are made up on the spot. So probably those are, those are two. So where do you get all that from? You get it from the arts. You get it from studying that kind of degree. But a quick, quick sort of caveat for those who are here with an arts degree and your swelling pride now, that you're all gonna go off and lead institutions of huge value now because you've got an arts degree. Other disciplines can do this. There's no reason that in science you can't get emotional intelligence, you can't be creative, you can't be innovative. You can get it from law, you can get it from all kinds of degrees. The simple difference though is this is what the arts are about. This is their aspiration to create people like this. This is why they exist in the first place. That's the differentiator being many of the other things that people might do in the course of their university study. In this discipline, in these disciplines, you are spending your time in areas that aspire to make you have those kinds of competencies and knowledge and skills. That is the, the simple difference. Now you might say, well this is the time to cut in and start telling us all about what we'll learn in history or sociology or the classics or whatever it might be. And of course, that's important. The knowledge you get out of studying an arts degree is extremely important. I think it's really important to say to yourself, I will not be an educated person until I have access to this kind of knowledge. In fact, it used to be the definition of an educated person that they did have access to this kind of knowledge, that they could say, I know the difference between Shakespeare and Bourdieu, and apart from that, it makes you a bloody sight more interesting to sit next to at a dinner party than someone who doesn't know this kind of stuff. You've got a wide range of knowledge and you can converse about all the kinds of things that might go to make up uh, the world as it's sitting in front of you this is the kind of thing that you can do with an arts degree. But I don't want to talk about that either. What I want to talk about are the qualities that you get from an arts education. It's the qualities that are most important for you if you have this kind of arts education. It's what makes it a compelling reason for us to carry on doing this. And I spent a bit of time just looking around at what people have to say, folks at Massey, looking at what other people are writing about at the present time. There are many, many books now that are in defense of the arts in one way or the other. And this is the list of things that I think are most important. The 
qualities that are most important for someone who gets an arts kind of degree. First of all, they're very simple these, they're very simple. So we'll start off with one of the most simple things. What you get from an arts degree is the ability to listen and most importantly, to hear. Listen and to hear. Think for a moment, these are very, very difficult skills. And in a world like the one we live in now, where information is 24 hours a day and it's coming in from many, many channels and it's coming in forms that you have not even an idea whether it's true or not, the ability to listen and actually hear is really important. But in the arts, you learn to pay attention. You learn to understand what other people have got to say. You get to follow an argument. You won't know what logic is. You know what illogic is. You look for the emotions behind what people are saying. And in the end, what you do is you begin to be able to put yourself in their shoes. You get an understanding because you've listened and you've actually heard what they say. Secondly, very simple again, you get to read and you get to understand. Educated people can appreciate all the sections in the newspaper, not just the sports page. They can do the comics and they can do the business page and they can do the news as well. They can read The Economist, they can read The New Statesman, they can read The Woman's Weekly, they can read The Listener, they can read Mountain Biking Today. In other words, they can read across all of these kinds of things and reading for these kinds of people goes beyond text. They can come to a museum like this and appreciate it. They can go to a concert and appreciate it. They can recognise the extraordinary in any field because they've learnt to recognise the best of things. They can see it in the natural world. They recognise great craftspersonship. They can shop around on the web and they can feel at home wherever they might be. They don't master everything, but they have curiosity. They have the willingness to try and understand and they become aware of what the broad world has to offer. Now, thirdly, they can talk with anybody. They learn the kind of ability to be able to make a speech, to ask questions, to maybe on occasion show a bit of humour. They can hold a conversation with somebody who's highly educated or maybe even won the Nobel Prize. They can sit down with a kid in a school and they can have a chat about what their life might be. They can go and talk to someone in an old person's home. They can spend their time talking to a wide range of people because they enjoy the whole process of talking, not because they want to talk about themselves, but because they want to understand what the other person is talking about. So they're, they're involved with their world in the sense that they want to find, find out. Now, a little story about Daniel Radcliffe that you might have heard, the person from, um, uh, from the famous films about wizards and all the rest of those kinds of things that you went along with your kids to see. He was on stage waiting to go on at some talk show, he said, and uh, Donald Trump was on there as well. And he said to Donald Trump, um, I'm a bit nervous going on here, millions of people, um, any advice? And Donald Trump said, don't worry, Daniel, just talk about me. <laughs> now, opposite, in other words, of a person who's interested in saying, well, I really want to get into a conversation here about you. That's the whole point of what we're doing here. That's what an education, uh, educated person would do. Fourthly, they can write persuasively and they can write movingly. People who are educated know how to put words on a screen or a piece of paper. They can, they've got that kind of ability to express themselves with them. Because they can express themselves, they have the ability to teach and they have the ability to persuade. Now, of course, we've just gone through a period of time where people have persuaded a whole lot of folks to go and vote for a post-truth idea. So there's a lot of persuasiveness in just telling slogans and telling lies. But the difference is these people are not committed to that. They're actually committed to ensuring you understand what's going on. They want to express deeply and completely what you need to understand, and they've got the ability to do it. They've found that. Whereas if you listen to Mr. Trump's speech, he's actually rewritten political discourse. It used to be, particularly in the mouth of Mr. Obama, for example, or John F. Kennedy, that you had to tell something that went from A to B and that things connected on the way through. But now you're just talking small snatches. 20 second little bites to add up and they don't need to add up. You can just move around all over the place. This is not teaching and persuasion like I mean here. This is to mislead people 
because they never get to fully understand what's going on. They just get the slogan. Educated people don't do that. Fifthly, they can resolve puzzles and problems. Now, if you're going to solve a problem, if you're going to solve a puzzle, you've got to have a lot of skills. In particular, what you have to be able to do is to look at an issue and pull it apart and look at the constituent pieces to see how they work and then have the ability to put it all back together again so you can see the whole. You've learned that kind of skill of being able to resolve the problem and resolve that kind of puzzle. Sixthly, they are interested in rigour and they search for the truth. I'm a modernist, I guess, still, really. Is postmodernism still running, Richard? It's dangerous if it is. But a modernist idea, of course, is there is such a thing as the truth. And I think we're finding out it's not a bad thing to talk about now, that to try and actually objectively go out and say, well, did that happen or not? Is it true that every Mexican who comes across the border is somebody who is committing a crime, or isn't it? Well, the truth is we now know, of course, there are more Mexicans leaving America than there are coming to America, and the many people, even the ones who are supposedly illegal, are making a contribution to the American economy that they won't be able to do without if they kick out 11 million of them. That was the truth. So finding out the truth and being rigorous seems a good idea. Wisdom is something to be treasured in this kind of environment. People like the educated folks I'm talking about here enjoy a good, well put together, reasoned argument. They aren't unduly, unduly impressed by people who argue because they understand there are things like verbal intelligence, so they have got ability to kind of look behind it and say, what is the story here? Does this person really have the kind of knowledge which stacks up that I can rely on or not? The extension of the kind of values we talked about before comes into the debate as well. This person may tell me a lot of things which are logical, but are they connecting with people? Does this really resonate with the lives of people or not? And bringing together knowledge and values is something educated people do, because what that means is that they get a dialogue going between those two things which leads to a better understanding. Seventhly, they, prompt, they practice humility, tolerance and self-criticism. This is another way really of saying that you can understand what other people are thinking, and you can understand the fears that they have as well, the good things and the bad things that might influence their lives. People who are educated can step outside themselves and their own experiences and say, let me have a look at the world from other people's points of view, and they can do that because they study languages, they learn about cultures, they explore the past, they understand that for many people the world's a sacred place and they want, even if they don't share those views, to understand what is that sacredness, what is that spirituality that drives people. And if they can do all that, they can start to say not only what do people differ on, they can start to say what do people have in common? What are they doing about the kinds of things that they share as a group of people? Now, if they can do that, then they start to want to be involved with the world. They understand that they need to get things done. You'll notice the figures I mentioned before are people in the arts who are leading companies. It's true for a whole lot of public sector areas as well. If you go through their education, you'll find overwhelmingly people have come from a social science, arts style of background because what they want to do is to get involved because they do understand how the world works. They do have these kinds of skills, so it tends to lead them to be involved with what the world is doing. The point of living, of course, I would have thought, is to try and make the world a better place, to leave it when you go somewhat better than when you came. That means it's an imperative for people like this to learn how the world works so that they can begin to say, well, how do I improve the world on the basis of my understanding of how it works? And we know there are abuses of power, but people who are educated know that they are going to be placed in those risky kind of positions and they try to seek to improve the world in a way which genuinely improves it and don't do it selfishly for themselves, and they understand they can't do this on their own. They nurture and empower people who are around them. They work with the other people to try and create a world that is a better place. None of us achieve anything on our own. It is one of the strangest things I know when I sit on stage often and listen to people giving graduation speeches and they tell you their life story and you would think no one else actually lived. It's I did this, I did that, I did this, I did this. Now and again people say thanks to my mother or my wife or whatever, but they will never say, look, I live in a society that had the, had the wisdom, for example, to provide me with the internet. And as a result, I started the business. I didn't invent the internet, I didn't pay for it. Somebody else did, they invented it, but it was really good, and I was able to use it and start a business and become really famous and 
very rich and here I am telling you my story. But I didn't do it on my own. I did it because there were other people around them and I have to be able to do the same, empower people, make them able to do the kinds of things that I've done because I am someone who wants to be part of a community that functions. We have things in common and that's how we'll achieve things. And the last point that comes out of just reading about what people have got to say about the arts is the ability to connect all of this. Listening, reading, talking, writing, puzzle solving, truth seeking, seeing through other people's eyes, leading, working with the community. If you can put all these things together, say the people who are looking at the arts and talking about what we might be able to do, if you can put all that together, then you end up being an educated person. And of course, if you do that, if you could do that, then you're set free. Because now you're the kind of person who can actually understand the world around them, who can work with that world, who understands what's going on here and can contribute to that world being a better place. And if we think about our education system, as much as we have to talk about employability and employment and jobs because people want employment and jobs, we need to talk about them as citizens in the world. We need to talk about these people who are living full, rich lives trying to work their way through the difficulties of living in the 21st century to make it a better century. We should judge our education system on whether it's equipping people to do that as well as get a job. That's the utility. That's the relevance of an arts degree in the 21st century. Now, a couple of just things I want to say before I close in terms of caveats. Nothing in here that I'm claiming should be taken to say that you can leave here and say I'm a superior being because I've got an arts degree. You can, you can if you've done sociology, but apart from that, you can't, you can't leave and say that. Because, of course, you never get all these things. You never get to listen perfectly and hear exactly what people have got to say. You never get the complete understanding that allows you to resolve the issues of the world. But you're trying by doing this. And we're giving people an opportunity by doing this. And the more people we give the opportunity to do this kind of education, and that we commit ourselves to giving them a good education, the more we've got people in the world who are capable of doing these kinds of things. We have a chance to not just set individuals free, but to set ourselves free. And that is clearly what the world needs right now. Mr. Obama, the other evening in Greece, was talking about the danger that we are moving towards a tribal world again, where people are saying, if you're not like me, then I don't really want to know you. In fact, I want to isolate myself. I want to see you as the other. I want to see you as the potential enemy. Right through Europe now, we've got people who are standing in Austria, in Germany, in the Netherlands, who think just like Trump. Mrs. Le Pen is out saying that there is now a worldwide movement of people who want to go down this kind of track. They're not all wrong, by the way. There are many things about the complaints that people like Mr. Trump and Le Pen make which are reasonable. An educated person, therefore, wouldn't write off everything they would say. They would engage with them. But when it leads to hatred, when it leads to division, when it leads to people being blamed for the problems of the world when they really have nothing to do with these problems, then we have the kind of world that Mr. Obama is saying that we should fear and that we should therefore commit ourselves to a great education system that ensures people do feel free, they do as communities feel free, to be able to take on these challenges in ways that are much more positive. So that's why, to go back to the point that was made right at the beginning, Brian, I think we have to put our money where our mouth is. It's not about saying, well, we quite like the arts. It's about, as a community of New Zealanders, saying these are relevant to us in the 21st century as much as anything else we do. We will ensure that our universities teach this. It will be taught to its maximum and taught to as many people as we possibly can because this is what we need in the 21st century. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to hearing what the panel has got to say. Next on the agenda is a performance by Callum Mara, who is a slam poet, which I think means poetry that's meant to be performed, not just read. And then we'll have our panel up, and we're going to get Steve up again later on um, to join them and to take questions from you. And I hope you've got a few questions to ask Steve. Callum is studying a communications degree at Massey University, and I'm hoping he one day may become RNZ's first slam poet newsreader. 
Here he is with his RNZ audition. Please put your hands together for Kalamara. Hey guys. Um, so I'm Callum, I'm a third year comm student just up the road at uh, Massey Wellington. Um, I'm about to do a poem for you that I wrote for a class earlier this year, but uh, if you'll let me, I'll just give you a quick anecdote. Um, when I was in, in high school, we used to have these conferences by people that would come in and talk to us about careers and things we could study and all this kind of stuff. And uh, we had a guy come in from a, uh, who was talking to us about doing trades. And he said that doing trades, if society is a car, getting a trade and working with your hands is the engine that keeps our society moving. And I think that's a nice idea. And I think that it's very easy for people who are in those industries to point to arts and the humanities and say, you know what, like that's not what keeps the car moving. That's not what keeps us going. But I would submit to you that if society is a car, the arts and the humanities are the steering wheel. We may not keep us in motion, but if we're gonna be in motion, we need to decide what direction we wanna point in. We need to decide where we wanna go. And when we get there, we need to decide what kind of place we want that to be. And I think that that's truly what arts and humanities are about. Um, so I'm very honored to be in this room talking to you guys. And uh, this is a poem called, uh, I am a man. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. When I was a kid, a kid on the opposing rugby team got into a fight with my friend. So I hit him, hard. Punches thrown faster than words, I winged left hooks and right hands like a boxer, like my dad taught me. Some days, I wonder what I would have been like if I'd played netball, traded in my Saturday mornings of mud and grass for cracked concrete. Maybe I would have learned to talk, learned to pivot and turn away. You cannot run in netball. But I am a man. Chromosomes etched into my fists, leaving behind scars and bruises of words unspoken, but all they seem to say to me is why. Maybe in the absence of rugby toughness, I would be able to throw these thoughts off my chest like a netball. But I am a man. We build up walls like our defense. We don't ask for help outside of a rock, and we are not allowed to be in pain unless the wounds are on the outside. You just need to get a bit of mongrel in you. Be tough. Man up. But more boys die when they man up than drink up. More boys die when they man up than pull up. Because when you man up, you shut up. And saying man up does nothing for a man down. Drowning, surrounded by more water than you can chug. And the size of your biceps will not help you swim. Falling from a great height, we sink to a bottom to a place full of weeds. Wrapping their tendrils around our ankles that we cannot kick off. And our gasping for air, we breathe in rugby. Cigarette smoke and Steinlager because we can't seem to think of a solution that comes outside of a box. I am a man. A patchwork quilt of testosterone and whiskey. I am a man. A stack of empty beer bottles woven together with fishing strings shoved in a jersey with the label all black. I am a man. I wear blue shirts and red shoes because I come from the nation of men and there is no pink on our flag. And yes, some days I wrap spikes to my feet, wear that flag across my back and trudge through mud and dirt with my brothers. But sometimes I don't feel as strong as I should. Sometimes I don't feel as strong as a man should. But I am a man and that's okay. Thank you. Thanks, Callum. It's panel time. Coming up on stage now, they're getting mic'd up. Uh, a quartet who will discuss some of the things that have been thrown out there by Steve Mahari, and also hopefully some of the things you might like to throw at them on the subject of the humanities and the arts. Representing the field of business, John Milford, he is the chief, he's the guy in the browns. Is that brown? I'm colorblind, by the way. So is it sort of brown or tan? He's in the tan jacket there. John is the chief executive of the Wellington Chamber of Commerce. I'm sure they've had an interesting week this week. Um, he's also been the managing director of Kilcardy and, St and Staines. He's a trustee of Scots College. He's been the general manager of Repco in Australia and Farmers. And Noel, he's worked with Noel Leeming as well, I think, at some point. He doesn't have a degree. His degree is in the art of uh, life, the school of life. 
which in a way I think I'm really pleased about that because I think it's good to have somebody from outside who's going to throw a few things our way. I'm pleased to have John with us. Nicola Leggett is from the world of journalism. She's second from your left. And you might know her byline. I first came across her byline, I think, in the 1980s. So old. At Metro. <laughs> she is now in charge of Massey University Press, putting out some fantastic publications. I don't know if we've got a stall out the back for later on for the books to sign, but maybe next time. Hannah August. Is, is that the right way to say August? Just like the month. Just like the month. Yeah. Hannah August. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. Represents literature on the panel. She has a PhD in English literature from King's College in London. I know her voice from reviewing books and the like on RNZ. She's a writer. She's a commentator. She's the author of a book you might have read called No Country for Old Maids, which looked at the man drought. I'm not sure if I concluded that women should just not bother about the man drought and just get on with it. <laughs> and she's here with us tonight. And Paul Spoonley on your left, demographer. Professor Paul Spoonley, he's from the Massey Canvas campus in Albany. Demographer, fellow of the Royal Society, specialises in population change. And there's been a lot of that in this country in the last generation or so. Though, and I'm just actually reading a book you co-authored at the moment, Paul, uh, and it's also interesting to, to read back about how much didn't change for so long, and sometimes a bit of that context when people might think, well, where does some of that um, maybe racist stuff come from in New Zealand? We're such a multicultural society. Well, if you go back to the 1930s and 40s, um, New Zealand was not that good at taking refugees. In fact, it's a little bit of a... I'd say a bit of a shame, really, a little bit of national shame. We didn't take many Jewish refugees before the Second World War and even after the Second World War. We struggled to take in refugees from Europe because they were too different, we thought, from the kind of New Zealand that our, our leaders at the time thought that we needed. Thankfully, that's changed, at least in my opinion. Paul, by the way, has come straight here from a careers advisory seminar or conference in Hamilton, where I hope he gave the humanities a great plug, um, and maybe even signed up a few students. And I've got for them a question that I'm going to throw at them now, and which then I'd like you to join in and throw questions at them too. The opening gambit is I wanted you all to think of something from outside of your field which had informed your career outside of your field of discipline. And because Paul's the furthest away from me, I thought I'd get you off first, Paul, with your answer. Am I allowed two answers, Brian, or oh, just of one? Of you are. OK, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the first one is really a few years ago, quite a few years ago, I was asked to chair the panel that was looking at CO2 reduction in New Zealand. And I thought, wow, I don't know anything about that. So I went along, and I was the only um, social scientist or humanities person there. And what was really interesting was that we knew a lot about this front end science of CO2 emissions, but the problem, which proved quite intractable, was how do you get behaviour change at the, at the back end of it? And so I learned a, quite a valuable lesson there in terms of we can have all of the hard science, as Steve referred to it, but if you actually don't have an impact on people and on communities, then what's the point of it? But I would like to use, um, the second example is a friend of mine died, Marty Friedlander. And Marty did the, when we first uh, wrote a book, we, 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 Steve and I were appointed and we wanted to make the social sciences, because we're both sociologists, relevant to New Zealand. So 1981, my first book, and I thought, oh, I'm going to go to Marty and I'm going to get some of her photographs. And I did. But what she did, we, we, she had thousands of photographs, but I'd never really seen the photographs that she had taken with Michael King mm. of Kuya. And I can remember sitting there seeing the world and a part of our world through her eyes. And it was a real privilege and it really gave me an appreciation 
of the community in which we live that I must confess I hadn't had before, and I'm very sad that she died. Hannah, you're close to me. <laughs> From outside of your field. Um, so my, my field is, I suppose, English literature, but many years ago when I started out uh, in my first year at Otago, I was a bit of a languages nut, and I decided that I would do a year's worth of ancient Greek ancient Greek language, and um, uh, it was five nine o'clock lectures a week. I don't know why I did it, but anyway, um, uh, I can remember we had this textbook called Reading Greek, and it had these sort of, these potted passages, these simplified passages of Greek literature and Greek philosophy, um, and one of the passages drew on um, a section of Plato's Apology in which Socrates is accused of being like the sophists who make the weaker argument the stronger. And I think it was designed to teach us about comparative adjectives and what they looked like in Greek. But, uh, but I, I remember thinking that it was the first time I'd really thought about the ethics of argument. And the, think about what Steve was saying earlier in terms of persuasion, the ethics of persuasion. Even if you have the rhetorical skills to persuade, there is still an ethical framework to that persuasion that if you want to shy away from sophistry, um, you, you need to adhere to. And that's certainly something that I've taken with me as I've gone on to mm. construct arguments in my writing over the past more than a decade. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Anna. Nicola, you're right in the middle of that sometimes at this course. Yes, yeah, so um, I guess I want to go right back, I suppose, to when I was at university. So I started thinking that I would do a purely English degree, um, but I also did a double major in history. And I can still remember uh, stage one New Zealand history being taught by Judith Binney and reading Alan Ward, A Show of Justice, which I think had been published the year before. And having come out of a so I was at high school in the early 70s, having come out of a very traditional girls' school education. Um, the history we learned was the Tudors and the French Revolution, and finding out how really basically land had been taken from Māori by the actions of the, of the um, native land court. And it was, the scales fell from my eyes. Um, and I, I think that um, that was a track that really led me to journalism and the whole thing of, of asking that question, oh really, can this be right? Um, so it was, it was still within the humanities, but it was, just, it was just that moment of knowing for the first time that something wasn't right in my own country. And um, that was a kind of a light bulb moment, I guess. John, your field is retail, if, if I'm studying your bio right. So what's I, informed your retailing from outside of retail? I think... Um, just a background, I came from a military back, family background, five generations, obviously, from the UK. And I rebelled against that because of the discipline and, and barriers that that put around me. But I think what influences me more around is parenthood, is actually having two sons, one who's a scientist and one who's a BA, and that whole dynamic of helping them as a parent, but also being in a position to be able to influence and help in society what the business community thinks and understands as well. So those are the sort of two things that drive me, but particularly from a business perspective, just helping our young people in this country making a contribution and um, the society we're trying to build, and that, that's what is the sort of the light bulb moment for me. What are the use of humanities for business? Well, um, thank you for quoting Ken Pamble because he's taken all my lines, but um, I think I told him those. But um, <laughs> again, I, my examples I draw from experience, which I find a better way to describe. Um, I've got a team of 30, I've got 10 graduates working for me. Um, none of them do, I think one of them does what they're actually subject they took to do. All of them are BAs, um, or have BAs. Um, they make it a great place to work. Because A, 
they are um, inquisitive, they're great communicators, they don't like discipline, they think outside of the square, they question, they provide an environment that allows us to connect with business in our organisation. And businesses need that. Businesses need that ability to have people who can spark, can add a dynamic, can actually question what's happening. And the point that Steve makes, I think, is really critical, can, can listen. Can actually listen and pull things apart. And I think that's the most important thing for business. And when we ask business, they tell us these are all important qualities. And yet that doesn't seem to translate into what certain people are saying that businesses need. There's a disconnect there. They're not actually listening to what business people are saying. They're assuming that. And I think that's, a, that's, that's one of the challenges. So Paul, if the experience of Otago University is something which has been shared by a lot of tertiary institutions, then why is it that students themselves, young men and women at the moment are thinking going for the humanities, going for the arts is a risky business. If I want to be sure of a career outside, once I've, once I've got my degree of being able to sustain myself, I'd better go for one of those STEM things. Why is that happening? STEM things. Um, <laughs> because, because in, uh, particularly since the 1980s, as we've moved into a new political and economic environment, where things are more difficult in many respects, there's been a very strong discourse where you study for very narrow instrumental purposes to get a job. And, and what's... Um, not amusing, that's the wrong way of saying it, but what's disturbing about that is that people who think that way don't understand our job market, don't understand the way in which employers are looking for a particular set of skills. Um, in preparation for this, I had a good look. The OECD is doing some very interesting study around the job market, and Richard, we need to update our statistics, because they say in 2016, a 15-year-old uh, living in a country like ours will do 17 jobs in five different industries over their working life. What they then did is that they took Sorry, this is a slightly long-winded answer, Brian. But they, they, they looked at what businesses were saying, and we know what businesses are saying, exactly what John's identified. So they looked at the OECD countries, and what they discovered was they wanted to know people's uh, digital literacy, but then they wanted to say, can they problem solve? Do you know that the average in the working age population who is capable of problem solving, let's leave aside the methodology for the moment, averages out at 31% of the workforce. You, no wonder that businesses are, are getting frustrated. By the way, New Zealand came out rather better at 40%, but we do need people who can problem solve. So we've got to, and this is our job, this is the job that Richard and I and our colleagues in the room, we need to say what the utility is of a degree in this modern world. And it's to counter some of the other discourses that are out there that, in my view, are way too narrow and don't understand the, the world of work. Hannah, I wanted to ask you something, I don't, um, which one of the things is, as a host of a RNZ national show is I mean, we get a fair bit of feedback, um, people texting in and emailing through. I think the more vocal uh, part of the audience in terms of feedback is the audience which is maybe a little bit more left wing. And one of the things about the arts, what the humanities, which I think is very important, there are a couple of things actually. Um, one which, which I think drives the way I approach my program, which is the word humanity, um, in the sense that what I'm trying to do in a very small way, because I know it's just a small contribution that I make, but still is to help us all recognize the humanity in others. And which means sometimes I talk to people from out from, I know a lot of people get upset when I talk to a, a Jewish woman who's most, most ter certainly a Zionist who lives in Israel. People say, why are you talking to this woman? Well, the point is that I want, 
I think it's important to also recognize the humanity in those people that I don't necessarily share some of her views, but then I don't live in Israel. Um, but I do think it's important to recognize the humanity in those, even those you disagree with. The other thing that I notice is those who are more vocal in feedbacking in getting in, in talking, and I don't know if they represent the entire audience that listens to RNZ National, I don't think they do, but there's, there's the other critical thing about, about the arts and humanities, which is critical thinking. And by that I also mean the ability to think outside or take in from outside your own bubble thoughts that you may not agree with and at least give them some respect. I hear a lot of people, I read a few, few texts from people saying, oh, that John Key, it's terrible what he's doing. It's terrible. We've got to get rid of this, this horrible man um, as prime minister. And I think, well, actually, he's quite a successful politician. He's not dumb. He's quite an intelligent man. I don't know if he has a degree in the humanities, but I do think he's quite intelligent. And I think just dismissing him as a rich banker, its fleet have deleted, is maybe missing a, little, a bit of the point. And that was a long-winded way of saying, you might be into the humanities, but how important is it, even if you are a student of the humanities, to be, to think and look outside your own bubble, your own sphere of comfort? And how much do you try to do that, Hannah? Oh, I mean, I, it's it's crucial, um, and I think um, uh, I think that can happen within the humanities and within, particularly within humanities um, courses at university. I mean, I used to teach um, a few years ago. I taught a, a Shakespeare course, a second year Shakespeare course at Otago, um, and there were a lot of, um, for some reason that year there were a lot of Malaysian exchange students in that class who had come over to, I think, do a year as part of a TEFL qualification, as part of teaching English as a foreign language, and those whose English was of a certain level were allowed to um, sit in on the Shakespeare course and come into the tutorials that I was running. And I've never forgotten this tutorial that we had on The Merchant of Venice, and some of you may know the play or not, but, um, uh, but essentially um, Shylock, the, the Jew in the play, has a daughter called Jessica who wishes to elope with, um, with a young man who's a Christian, and she, she does this, and, um, uh, and she takes, when she goes, she takes a lot of Shylock's money and some of um, his jewels, including this ring that's been given to him by his dead wife that is, has sentimental value for him. And basically, when he discovers that she's gone, his, um, his pressure is all on the money that has been gone and, um, uh, and on the, the callousness of her theft rather than attempting to understand why she's gone, um, why she's made this decision in, in response to his own draconian parenting. And I had this moment in this tutorial where the New Zealand largely Pākehā students were at war with the Malaysian students coming from two completely different cultural backgrounds um, in which the Malaysian students were attempting to articulate how disrespectful she had been to her father mm -hmm. and how his reaction was completely justified, whereas they, of course, had sympathy for this young young lady who wanted to go off and be with her love and um, were looking at it from a much more kind of Western romantic viewpoint, I think. And it was just this wonderful moment of, ah, oh, I can see it from your point of view. And, and that had happened through the lens of a piece of, a piece of English literature that was 400 years old. And so I think we, we need to, when we talk about the value of the humanities, often Talk, use these specific examples of things that happen within, within courses that are being taught in New Zealand universities today of how they can facilitate that talking across cultural barriers. Brian, can I just say that I, I think that one of the ways that the humanities and BA degrees actually need to market themselves is kind of offer a promise of you will learn all this amazing stuff. I loved what the Vice Chancellor said about you will be set free intellectually, but actually I remember when I got to university, it was like this, it was like being at this massive all-you-can-eat smorgasbord, you know, Victorian novel tick, metaphysics tick, ethics tick, German, you know, it was like, it was like an all-day brain festival, and it felt like such a joy and a privilege that I was being offered 
all this stuff. Of course, it was free. You know, it was like I speak from a galaxy far, far away now. But you know, I think sometimes we don't we don't sell students enough on the fact that it's just going to be really fantastic. You're going to learn all this great stuff, and it's such a privilege. Um, where else are you going to find this stuff out? Actually, you can't really find it on Google. It is not the same as sitting in a lecture theatre with the most wonderful professor entertaining you for an hour. Um, and I think, the, I think maybe that's, that's the beauty of a humanities degree and humanities papers at a university. If I was, if I was in charge of marketing, that's what I'd be saying. It's just, come on in, you know, the shops, the shops open 24-7 and it's just fantastic. Would you still drive on a sports car thinking. like Steve did? <laughs> Sorry? Would you still drive a sports car like Steve did? Would I still drive yeah. a sports car? I don't know. Yeah, haven't you seen that, Red? <laughs> no, I only drive Volvos. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what I thought I'd do now, are there any people who want to um, throw some questions at the panel? And I think I might get Steve up as well. Are you still mic'd up, Steve? Have you lost? Anybody got any questions? Uh, what we might do is, um, if you can get that mic over to where that person is, Richard. Uh, well, we got a great bonus. I'm wondering if you can um, help me with a question I've been troubling over around the liberal arts just recently. It seems to me that we may have failed uh, as educators. And my question is, why have a liberal arts educated intelligentsia failed to engage with and predict this post-truth politics. And I'm just wondering if you could kind of help me think through that. Thank you very much. Who wants to have a crack at that one? <laughs> I think we've been in a bubble. I think we've been in a bubble that is partly of our own making and partly of the internet's making. And the, the way that our our tastes are so predicted these days by the technology that we use that unless we actively force ourselves out of that bubble, which is something, again, that humanities teaching can train us to do, um, uh, but which when you leave the sphere of the classroom is, does have to be an act of will, I think. You can be given two conflicting accounts of a fact and be asked to assess the evidence and then write an essay demonstrating what the most persuasive one to you is within this context of examination. But unless you carry on making yourself do that, unless you bring those articles from the conservative newspapers into your Facebook feed um, and actively engage with them yourself, then you can become complacent and you can forget that there are contrasting perspectives. And I think we, as people who are trained, I mean, I talk about the humanities a lot, and trained in the arts, um, we have a responsibility to carry on using the tools that our education gives us, I think. And I think maybe we haven't been as good at exercising that responsibility recently as we should have been. Anybody else want to answer that? Yeah, I do. I, I think we're very, in a very privileged situation to be in universities and to be studying the humanities that Nicola um, talks about. Um, but we also have a responsibility to be, as the Vice Chancellor said, to be citizens. And in some way, I think I would make an argument for going back to some of the basic tenets of sociology. We've forgotten class. And, you know, the white lash that's occurred in the US. I mean, I spent quite a bit of my time trying to understand extreme neo-Nazis. And some of my colleagues just dismissed them as being irrational, as being somehow on the fringe of our world. No, they're not. They're part of our world, and we need to understand them. And so I think there's been a failure in terms of engaging with some of the big questions of our time by some of us, not all of us, and therefore of understanding both that which we agree with and that which we disagree with. Yeah, I, I think it, it, all this is absolutely right, I, I think. But I, just to add to that, the way politics have evolved, if you notice that Mr Cameron's um, advice stream in uh, the UK almost entirely went to Cambridge, went to Eton with him, mm. and they were all fabulously bright people and had no understanding at all of what people who live in, in uh, the middle of England were going through in terms of worrying about migration and jobs. In the States, nearly all the media now lives on the east or west coast. 
I never even go into the middle anymore to understand people. And the big question isn't so much to understand why we've split, split apart, because that's pretty obvious to us all. The question is, how do you put it back together again? And in this country, for example, it's about the only place you can go now in, in broadcast media is to Radio New Zealand with, I don't know, maybe it goes between... <laughs> but, the, but the killer is, of course, the audience runs between 4% to 11% share most of the time. So that's another bubble. But it's one, it's one of the only places. You go and listen to Duncan Garner, you go and listen to Mr Hoskins, you go and listen to um, Paul Henry, then you're with another group of people. And so we, we have very few places anymore where you can actually get people to hear each other and get to understand what each other thinks. And that's going to be the big question. How do we reconnect with, with each other? Anybody else want to answer that? Well, I, I do think that the media, you know, does have some responsibility here. And there's, there has been a lot of talk about, you know, I think that there's been a, the media's been doing a lot of self-flagellation in the, in the days since and talking about the fact that they flew in and out of those industrial states didn't spend enough time on the ground, that they were just flying around in that kind of little elite bubble. And I remember, you know, when I, <clears throat> when I was a young journalist, my, edit, my then editor at Metro, Warwick Roger, used to say that a journalist's job was to, the, his kind of analogy was, you know, walking past a cave, a caveman walking past a cave, and there'd be a smell at the back of the cave. Most, most people would be too scared to go into the cave, right to the back to see what it was, but it was a journalist's job to go in there. And of course, that's what journalists used to do, um, used to have time to you know, hang around the freezing works, hang around the smoko rooms, just pick up stuff on the street. No one has that time anymore, not only not in the United States, but here neither. And so I think the media, uh, the, the nice little kind of chattering class bubble that so many of us live in, it's a, it's a rude shock when we find out that not everyone thinks like us, but we, just, we shouldn't have been so surprised. Just not enough time, I think, um, on the ground. And really, I think it's a, it is going to be a crisis in America, but it's, but it's a similar thing here. Our media is now so weakened and so diminished that I don't quite know how people are going to be put back out into the, into the country. I mean, it will be interesting to see at this next election whether that kind of groundswell of unhappy, alienated people, which of course we have in New Zealand, but somehow we've managed kind of manage the trick of mostly keeping people pacified. Is that something that might come here? Is that something that Mr. Key ought to be thinking about? You know, might that, might that come and bite the current national coalition? I don't know. John, um, you can't exist from, a, a, come from outside of the humanities training that most of the people in this room have. Do you think when you work as a retailer where you've got to be pretty real about, because if you're not real about it, what people want, you're not going to make a living. Do you think there's a bubble that you can observe from the outside? Um, just going back to the, the, the question about, um, I, I passionately believe there's a disconnect between secondary and tertiary trade. I think there's a disconnect in there as an observation that we don't start having conversations with young people and their parents about their futures, the world they face. Actually, because you're a lawyer doesn't mean that your son or daughter should be a lawyer or whatever. So I think those are observations that I make about we've got to, we've got to get those dots joined up because if we don't, we will continue having this disconnect if we say we need more engineers or we need more scientists because that's today's focus. Actually, what's the next 25 years? What's the next 50 years? The disruption factor. What skills do young people need to be equipped with to, to those challenges? And I, and I think those are bubbles. I think those need to be burst and we need to look at that as a continuum. Um, certainly, um, the retail environment is going through the biggest disruption now that it's ever gone through. Um, but it's quite interesting that um, I think retail cycling back 200 years because, you know, if you'll recall, and, you know, when Selfridges 
opened, it was all about the experience. It actually wasn't about the goods. You know, it was all about, you know, you want an elephant, you want an African, or do you want an Indian elephant? It, but it was about an experience. So that whole thing is changing um, in some ways, where it's on one side it's commodity, on the other side it's experience. And experience is about human interaction. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but... You brought up another thing I, I was interested in, and that is that it's all very well to talk about the importance of the humanities and tertiary institutions, which of course is the focus of Arts 21, but many people won't go to universities, and, but those people still vote. And how important is it that we encourage younger students, secondary students, to be critical thinkers? to think beyond slogans, to be a little bit suspicious when somebody offers them an easy solution which just involves building a wall and keeping people on the other side of it, or whatever it might be. How's it going at Knox? Scott, sorry. Um, look, I mean, the reality is young people are not engaging, and that's the challenge. And, and even young people who have humanity degrees are not wanting to engage in in, in, in what's happening in our country. Look at the polls, look at, the, at, at that. Um, I think, you know, I'm not quite sure what the answer is. I don't know that. How do you get people to care? How do you get people to say, I can make a difference? How can you say that my opinion is valuable? How do you create that environment that people are prepared to do that? When you have the contrast to that is you get shouted at, this is what your view should be. You know, and you talk about that sort of Trumpism. It, it's, you know, he's just pressing people's buttons and, and, and that. But how do you get people to question that? I don't know what the answer to that is. But what I do know, it's about engaging our younger people, younger, to actually make them see the value in questioning, making see the value of them having their own opinions and being comfortable to express them. How many of the rest of the panel have kids that are school age? My children have left school now, but I, w I would actually say that the secondary school system is doing a pretty good job of that, encouraging critical thinking. Um, I think, you know, certainly, you know, since I was at school where it was very much teacher driven, I, I think that that's a quite a strong strand in the curriculum. I think we um, denigrate young people very easily as being, you know, kind of apathetic, disinterested, just plain. I don't think that's true. Um, I, this year at the Auckland Writers Festival, Gloria Steinem came to speak to a packed Aotea Square, Aotea Centre, and there were questions afterwards, and I expected that the people who would stand up and ask her questions would be the old, you know, broadsheet generation. But in fact, were, they were all these wonderful young early 20s women who were very strong, committed feminists. So I actually, I, I think... Um, it's too easy to say that young people are disengaging and don't care. They've got different ways of showing that they care, different ways of communicating. Um, and I think actually they are much more independent thinkers than my generation was. We were easily radicalised. It was just a thing you did, you know, let's go on a march. Um, I think it's much more complicated now. They've got many more things to sift through and that most of them do a pretty good job of it. I endorse that. I, I was the Minister of Education for a little while, which was a golden age, obviously. Um, <laughs> but it gave me a chance to, to, to go to a lot of schools. And I have to say that I came away with the impression that we're still running an education system where teachers are committed to a full curriculum. They're ex they, they are trying to put experiences across the board in front of, of kids. But the danger is you're beginning to see the same kind of trend here as you see elsewhere around the world. That is because people are shifting into a different housing community so that they go to a similar school. They're getting pressures for charter schools that say this is all stuff you don't need to know. We'll just focus on these things that you, you really ought to know as part of what we think is important for an education system. The key is to hanging on to a curriculum uh, that informs all children adequately about everything all the way through their, their schooling. If they don't do that and we begin to allow people to move off into little pockets, that will get us into the same position that you find in many other countries that people are just not learning that, that broader range of, of knowledge and skills anymore and they are becoming part of that divisiveness. But right now, I think we are not doing a bad job for, for young people and we are still able to give them that broader experience in most cases. Can I say something? Richard and I have been going into schools or working with groups of schools and they're 
and their senior leaders, and Richard does a fantastic job, but we challenge them and we ask them what's top of mind, and then we ask them to articulate that and then to provide solutions. But we're dealing with a particular cohort, and I, they've been fantastic. I don't know what your impression is, Richard, but we've been, I've been really impressed by that. But there are some schools that you've got to say, are they providing students with opportunities? Are they providing them with credentials? And the 72,000 students that are neat, or uh, 72,000 youngsters who are neat, not in education, employment and training, that is a major concern. Can I just um, slightly contradict my Vice Chancellor? Um, moving into a global age, I think multilingualism is hugely important. The irony is that the school is now narrowing down choices so that in year 12 and 13, we're getting fewer students taking languages other than English and Māori. And you referred to before the University of Otago. Look at what's being cut there. Languages are being cut. I don't understand this in a world in which we need to understand other cultures and we need to understand those other cultures by speaking their languages here and abroad and yet the numbers taking languages in this country are dropping at both secondary school and at university. I fully endorse those comments. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have a question from the floor? Yes, a few arms going up. There's also that chap in the middle there. But you go first. Kia ora. Uh, there's been a large investment by the government uh, in education and secondary school, uh, we're all secondary school drama teachers, um, in the vocational pathways. And I don't know how much you know about the vocational pathways, but it basically silos uh, subjects of education, categorises everything into six different industries. For a long time there were only five of them, and it took about 18 months worth of fighting to actually get the creative industries petal into the vocational pathways. Um, of which actually I, I have questioned the validity, the validity of doing so because to me creativity is something that as we've talked about today stems across all subject areas. And I think that um, we've worked, we talk a lot within the arts uh, as the, in terms of the need for advocacy for the arts. Uh, yet at the Drama New Zealand Australia conference in Sydney last year they talked about the fact that we've, we've missed the boat. Um, about the fact that we keep talking about the fact that the arts uh, create uh, innovative, creative people and that that's what we need for our future, yet for some reason the arts are dying, uh, of which I mentioned the vocational pathways because they're not helping. I think it's great to advocate for what the arts give kids in terms of a fully rounded education so that they can go into a range of employment opportunities. But I also concern a I'm concerned about the cost of, what about creating art for art's sake? What happens in our world if we don't celebrate the arts for the drama, the dance, the musicians that we create as well? What do we lose if we look too broadly into the value of the arts and education? I'm going to chuck that at you, Steve, first. Well, if I understand the question correctly, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that's the whole point, really, of what I was saying today. We, can, we get drawn into this argument all the time that says, what is the utility for a job for this? And we can answer that quite happily. The debate has not been broadened to say, well, that's, that's good, we've got that um, understood. But what about the rest of people's lives? What about the rest of the society we live in? And what is the utility and relevance of the arts for that wider range of things that we do, we want to do a, as a society. If we end up with, as, as we all talk about, this very narrow focus on what you're going to do for a job, what skills you're going to have, what does happen to a person uh, in terms of their wider participation, their appreciation of nature, their understanding of how their world works, all that starts to be seen as a secondary, less important thing. So yeah, I, I think that is the argument that we have to make. We can tell you about the utility for a job, but let's start talking about life and how this prepares you for that. And just as a, a little anecdote, the bit, I, I left school very early when I was 15, I didn't like school much, but the, the single most important part of my schooling was uh, when I was an intermediate and the uh, teacher used drama for nearly everything we did. So, so we learned to run shows, so we learned math through drama, we learned finance through drama, we learned production through drama, we learned memory through drama, because he was absolutely besotted with the idea that this was one of the, the ways that you could learn all of the skills you needed 
uh, through through the door of, of um, producing a, a theatre. And that's, that's one of the reasons I fully support the fact that we've got it where, where we are in our university. I want to see it there, not just um, for the sake of preserving the arts, but because, of course, it, it gives you such a window on everything that you might do in life. So, yes, we've got to make this argument broader and not allow ourselves to be corralled into saying, will it get me a job? That's important, but there are other things as well. Can I respond to that also? I think, we are li I think what is really difficult about doing that is that we're living within this this kind of rhetorical structure where value is conceived of as economic value. And I think there are, there are a whole load of government policy documents that have fed into that discourse over the past couple of decades, and you're beginning to see it um, you're beginning to see it reflected in media reporting as well. And we need to I mean, I think, again, it comes down to resp our responsibility as humanities graduates to widen the type of discourse that we are using and to think about other types of value. You know, if you've got a kind of an economic input on this side, it doesn't have to be an economic output on that side. I think a good analogy is probably having children. Like, if you looked <laughs> at the, um, you know, if you weighed up the financial benefits, the economic value of having children, you'd go, no. <laughs> and, um, but that's, of course, not the point. Um, and I think it's, it's the same with, with fostering the arts. We need to widen our, our idea of what our values systems are and and it's you know and that's why we need to get more humanities graduates working in the public sector working in government working in these roles where they can kind of fight back against that dominant language how are we off for time 10 minutes so does anybody else want to address that question if not there's the chap with the black jacket and get the mic over to him does anybody else want to talk about creativity Just a question about university leadership. The New Zealand University uh, legislation refers to the importance of universities being the critic and conscience of society. I was wondering if the, anyone on the panel want to give the universities a grade um, in terms of how well they're doing this, uh, A, B, C, uh, D, um, first. And second, um, any thoughts on whether the humanities have a role in leadership in terms of, of, of being a public critic and conscience for society? Well, John, I think we'll throw that grey one at you first when you're on the other side. <laughs> um, isn't it interesting that um, if you reflect on the stats that Steve shared with us and we'll presume that they're correct, um, how many leaders of industry in society actually have BAs? And yet we're having this debate about the reality, the, rep, the you know, the, the importance. I, I, I can't reconcile those two things. So, if business leaders, political leaders, have actually um, have, have had, had value, and, and and they've got where they've got with what they, they they have, why are we having this debate? Surely they would be your biggest advocates. Surely that would be, yeah. it would be, self-fulfilling. So I don't, I don't understand why it isn't, in some ways. It's illogical, isn't it? I think the reason is what Hannah said, that there is a... Does this work, Frank? Can you hear me? Yep, yeah. you're in there. Is, is there is a discourse. A discourse isn't just language. Discourse is the framing of things. And we now frame things in, in a way which many people just don't want to, to champion these things. One of the things I noticed in politics was many people had a BA or they had a, had a social science humanities degree, and they were actually the worst people about um, teaching the bloody stuff. You say, what, what's, what's the problem that got you here? And now, now you, you're saying it's no good for anybody else. That, that discourse problem is, is huge. D, Frank. D. And, and it's one of the huge <laughs> problems that we've got, is that people who have tenure constantly tell me they're afraid to speak out. You say, we can't even fire you if we tried. <laughs> Say it, say it, get on with it. And I, I think one of the problems that we have in our universities at the moment is that we've got too few people like Paul, who's constantly in the media, being a public intellectual, talking about issues, and being a, a prepared to do this kind of stuff. For God's sake, we've just got to get our universities to actually be critics and conscience people. And go beyond that, by the way. It's all very, very well to be a critic and a conscience person, but right now people wouldn't mind a few answers as well. So being brave enough to say, well, I don't know, you know, you don't have to take everything I say, but on the basis of what I know, this would be quite a good thing to try. 
think we do have to engage again as universities and not, and not feel somehow afraid to be out there doing things. So I, I think at the moment we're not doing our job very well in that public discourse way, except for Massey. <laughs> ask you, Steve, um, in response to that, as someone who's not currently employed in a university, how easy do you think it is for academics working within New Zealand universities to do that structurally in terms of their teaching commitments, in terms of their requirements to publish within their specialism, which might not necessarily be the thing that they would be speaking as a public intellectual about, to take on the administrative loads within their departments. I mean, are there reasons, are there structural reasons that academics in New Zealand aren't fulfilling that critic and conscience role to the extent that they should be at the moment? Yes, but that's always been the case. And in, um, you know, when I was a junior lecturer, I had 13 tutorials a week, plus five lectures, plus the marketing that went with it. It hasn't changed that much. It has, it has always been a busy life. And of course, the, the, the question that you ask probably should be directed to people like Paul or Richard or Mike Joy. These are all people who carry a full teaching load. They still publish. They still do all the things that are required in their university. But they use what they know to go out and engage. And of course, this is something we value as part, as a part of the university environment. We want to see people do this. So uh, we've just changed our criteria to make it even clearer. Uh, for promotion, that we want to see people engage in this kind of way at our university. And I, I know that other universities do say the same kind of thing. They want to support people to do this. And remember, of course, it's not going to be a 24-hour job. It's not like people are going to be ringing you up all the time to say, Frank, give me another quote. It'll be now and again that, that somebody will be saying that that area of my knowledge now should be engaged with the public out there because business people would like to hear about this or the government would like to hear about this. So it's not like you're asking people to be full-time commentators. You're just asking the community of scholars to become publicly engaged and enjoying the debate. That's, that's what I think we need to do. And at the moment, I don't think we're doing well, well enough in that area. No. No, I, I, I'd agree with that, Frank, and I think we need to empower our staff to do that. But, you know, when Brian rings you up and asks to interview you, he's a pretty scary person, and, and not all of us can do the public, uh, the, the, the public conversation very well, but I do think that we need to step up and be more vocal. We're, we're in a very privileged place. We have, we have a secure employment, as the VC has said, and we have information. We should share that information, not simply with our students, but we should share it in more public domains. And if, if Brian rings you, please say yes, because you know that's an important part, even if it's only 11% of the population. And it fills a hole, too. <laughs> Frank, what, because he's any? trained, of course. Any more questions? <laughs> I think there's one the gentleman at the front with the tie. Oh, we're waiting for the mic. He's also a member of my choir, that guy there about to speak. The Doubtful Sounds. Very good choir, I might add. Well, Take it away, Max. Um, my question, which is uh, sadly not to do with um, choir matters, but picks up actually on a question you raised earlier, is about the, the possible the downsizing of the humanities departments at Otago and Victoria, which has obviously been driven by falling student numbers which I think poses a pretty fundamental question. I mean, are we going to let the shape of our universities be determined by the market force that is the aggregated choice of a bunch of 18-year-olds? Um, and, you know, with, with no disrespect to 18-year-olds, I mean, I think about my 18-year-old self, um, you know, I'm not entirely sure I knew what I was doing. Um, I mean, do we need to push back against that? And if we're going to do that, what is the argument? I mean, do we need to be more bold-faced about saying these departments are valuable even if they don't have a lot of students at the moment because we know they're going to be needed for the long term and we're just going to put a stake in the ground and say that? Do we say that we think these enrolments are going to fluctuate and it's important to stick it out at least for another decade to see if it's an ongoing trend? Do we say these people are, these lecturers are valuable as researchers even if they have no one to teach? Or do we say that actually institutions do change, they do flux, they do go through flux, and these, these departments, downsizing is just part of how institutions change over decades or centuries. Where are we at with that question? Shall, shall I start? 
Um, I, I think there are internal and external dynamics. So the internal dynamic is that do we value these um, subjects and the people that teach them? And what we do at Massey University is we cross-subsidise and we make sure that um, parts of... Uh, if, you, if you reduce it to simply an economic decision, then we wouldn't be teaching quite a bit of the stuff that we do teach. So that's an internal mechanism, and unfortunately it's got to the point at Otago and Waikato and Victoria where some of that is just not possible. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm not sure of the details, so I'm not going to speculate beyond that. But the other part of that is to go out into external audiences and actually be very clear about the value, what, however defined, so we might want to describe that value in terms of anticipating what's happening in the labour market, but also as providing you with something that's interesting, as Nicola said before, that's just important for you and your personal growth. And we've got to then go out and convince audiences, which range from politicians right the way through to that 18-year-old that you've described, that what we do is actually valuable. Very often, our colleagues like if you take the STEM, that argument is made for them by others. I think we have a responsibility now to be very assertive and probably quite aggressive in terms of making that argument in our own interests, but also on behalf of the society in which we live. So I've, I feel very passionate about it. Uh, Richard has a role in doing that, and we invite our colleagues to do that in the various forums of which they're part. And I think that's going to be an ongoing battle for the reasons that we talked about before in terms of the post-truth age. We've got to fight the good fight, really, and that's partly in terms of what we teach, it's partly in terms of our jobs, but I think we're doing it for the greater good as well. I hope we were, are anyway. I, th I think, too, if I could add that, um, you know, I know this is, this is very mechanistic, but I think we also have to demonstrate that there are jobs, because when I think about when I went to university in 1974, this, this old discourse about, well, what are you going to do with a BA, you know, the degree of bugger all, that was what people also said in 1974. Yeah. And, in fact, the career path for someone like me with a master's degree in English was just straight into school teaching. That's what most people did. But the difference, I think, was that people valued school teaching. You know, that seemed like a very good and fine career to be going into. And it wasn't so much that arts then was, was competing with the STEM subjects, it was it was competing with law. That was the hot thing to do. So I think this thing, is, this thing has been around for a long, long time. Certainly when I was at university, there weren't the careers that there now are that you can take on with a BA. There wasn't really advertising. Advertising agencies were just in their infancy. There wasn't public relations. There wasn't really market research. Um, you know, there's a whole lot more things now that you can do with that degree. So when parents say, what are you going to do with a BA? I think we have to kind of roll out, well, here are the jobs, and, and there are many. Because unfortunately, people are going to think in that way. They just, they just are. Yes, there's a, there's a greater personal and societal good, but actually, happily, there are also jobs. John, did you One want thing to... I'd add, uh, and is that Massey currently, with the business community that I'm in, is the only one that's actively out talking about humanities. None of the other universities are as passionate and um, cohesive and coherent about the values and what that can give to the business community. So hence the reason I'm here and, and, and see the value. And I think Steve point's very valid. You know, unless you actually have to go out and actually sell the, you, you, it's, it's you know, it's, I, I don't suppose it's any, it, it's no coincidence that your, your role's growing when the BAs and, your, and other universities are dropping. Well, you've actually got to get out there and find, find the people and actually do it. So that's what I would say. Would strike me, Steve, if all the other universities are running away, then there's a market niche for you. There is, and in fact, it may be one of the answers. The, the, the problem at the moment, of course, is we sort of have a volume-driven system, so it is the aggregated um, choices of people that's driving, driving uh, whether you have a discipline or not. If they're not coming, then you can't employ people, so you get rid of them, and, and it, that, that's the cycle. What we do need is a much more 
um, intelligent approach to what does a country like this need in the 21st century and if things are not working too well, we're going to talk about that rather than just say the numbers have dropped, so, so get rid of those folks. But the quid pro quo has got to be, and this I think is, a, is something that humanities and social science people have to face up to, is they have to prove their relevance. And, I, and I, in jobs, yes, but in other things too, because as Paul points out, there's no point in having a climate change debate if you don't talk about people. You know, there, there's a whole range of issues that need to be addressed by bringing the relevance of this into play. And I think when you go around a lot of humanities and social science departments in this country at the moment, a lot of the staff are locked into what they did 25 years ago. I have to go and talk to the sociology conference in a couple of weeks' time, and one of the things I'm going to say to them is, you're dull and boring, you know? A lot of you are just dull and boring. You're still doing things that were relevant to your classes ages ago. There's a really exciting agenda of things that social scientists and humanities people should be engaging with this right now, and you'd get the same kind of zip out of people arriving at university saying, you mean I can talk about that stuff? Mm. As we got when we went in the 70s, it would be very much that same kind of feeling. So I think what Paul is talking about has been the big change in our behaviour, which only began about three years ago, when we, we sort of thought, oh, maybe we should go and talk to people. You know, go out and find out what they're really talking about and thinking about and begin to engage our curriculum with what they are doing. Now, who knows if it'll work, but it's at least a whole lot better than sitting in your office and thinking they really want to read this book that I thought was important 20 years ago. This engagement is really important. So we've got to play our part too and not just say it's too, too valuable, so you must leave us alone. That's not an answer. That won't work. Now, on that note, I'm getting signals from Richard, who's, I think, suggesting that if we don't wrap it up, we're going to miss out on our drinks and refreshments on the other side of the um, bridge, the Rangi Marae um, room. So I'd like to um, invite you to put your hands together for our panel guests, Paul Spoonley, Nicola Leggett, John Milford, Hannah August, and Steve Mahari. Richard Shaw, organizer. And also Jackie. Is it Jackie or is it? Nicole? Nicole is not here. Also the sound people, thank you very much. Was Nicole here? Yeah. Hand up higher than that, Nicole. And also the sound people. I'm Brian Crump. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm Brian Crump. Thanks very much for coming. Let's go and have a drink. Cheers. <laughs>